The red glare of the torch lighting up the interior of the blockhouse showed me the worst of my apprehensions realized. The pirates were in possession of the house and stores. There was the cask of cognac. There were the pork and bread, as before, and what tenfold increased my horror, not a sign of any prisoner. I could only judge that all had perished, and my heart smote me sorely that I had not been there to perish with them. There were six of the buccaneers, all told. Not another man was left alive. Five of them were on their feet, flushed and swollen, suddenly called out of the first sleep of drunkenness. The sixth had only risen upon his elbow. He was deadly pale, and the blood-stained bandage round his head told me that he had recently been wounded, and still more recently dressed. I remembered the man who had been shot and run back among the woods into the great attack, and doubted not that this was he. The parrot sat preening her plumage on Long John Silver. He himself, I thought, looked somewhat paler and more stern than I was used to. He still wore the fine broadcloth suit in which he had fulfilled his mission, but it was bitterly the worse for wear, daubed with clay and torn with the sharp briars of the wood. So, said he, here's Jim Hawkins, shiver me timbers, dropped in, huh? Well, come now, I take that friendly like. And thereupon he sat down across the brandy cask and began to fill a pipe. Give me a loan of the link, Dick, said he, and then, when he had a good light, that'll do, lad, he said, stick the glim in the wood heap, and you gentlemen bring yourselves to. You needn't stand up for Mr. Hawkins. He'll excuse you. You may lay to that. And so, Jim, stopping the tobacco, here you were, and quite a pleasant surprise for poor old John. I see you were smart when first I set my eyes on you, but this hair gets away from me clean it do. To all this, as may be supposed, I made no answer. They had me set with my back against the wall, and I stood there, looking silver in the face, pluckily enough, I hope, to all outward appearance, but with black despair in my heart. Silver took a whiff or two of his pipe with great composure, and then ran on again. Now, you see, Jim, so be as you are here, says he, I'll give you a piece of my mind. I've always liked you, I have for a lad of spirit, and the picter of myself when I was young and handsome. I always wanted you to join and take your share, and to die a gentleman. And now, my boy, you've got to. Cap'n Smollett's a fine seaman, as I'll own up to any day, but stiff on discipline. Duty is duty, says he, and right he is. Just you keep clear of the cap. The doctor himself has gone dead against you. Ungrateful scamp was what he said, and the short and the long of the whole story is about here. You can't go back to your own lot, for they won't have you, and without you start a third ship's company all by yourself, which might be lonely, you'll have to join with Captain Silver. So far, so good. My friends then were still alive, and though I partly believed the truth of Silver's statement, that my cabin party were incensed at me for my desertion, I was more relieved than distressed by what I heard. I don't say nothing as to your being in our hands, continued Silver, but there you are, and you may lay to it. I'm all for argument. I never seen good coming out of threatening. If you like the service, well, you'll join. And if you don't, Jim, well, you're free to answer no. Free and welcome, shipmate. And if fairer can be said by mortal seamen, shiver my sides. Am I to answer then? I asked with a tremulous voice. Through all this sneering talk, I was made to feel the threat of death that overhung me, and my cheeks burned and my heart beat painfully in my breast. Lad, said Silver, no one's oppressing you. Take your bearings. None of us won't hurry you, mate. Time goes so pleasant in your company, you see. Well, says I, growing a bit bolder, if I'm to choose, 
I declare I have a right to know what's what, and why you're here, and where my friends are. What's what? repeated one of the buccaneers in a deep growl. Ah, he'd be a lucky one as knowed that. You'll perhaps batten down your hatches till you're spoken to, my friend, cried Silver truculently to the speaker. And then, in his most gracious tones, he replied to me, Yesterday morning, Mr. Hawkins, said he, in the dog watch, down came Dr. Livesey with a flag of truce. Says he, Captain Silver, you're sold out. Ship's gone. Well, maybe we'd been taking a glass and a song to help it round. I won't say no. Leastways, none of us had looked out. We looked out, and by thunder the old ship was gone. I never seen a pack of fools look fishier, and you may lay to that if I tells you that looked the fishiest. Well, says the doctor, let's bargain. We bargained, him and I, and here we are. Stores, brandy, blockhouse, the firewood you was thoughtful enough to cut, and, in a manner of speaking, the whole blessed boat from cross trees to Kelson. As for them, they've tramped. I don't know where's they are. He drew again quietly at his pipe. And lest you take it into that head of yours, he went on, that you was included in the treaty, here's the last word that was said. How many are you, says I, to leave? Four, says he, four, and one of us wounded. As for that boy, I don't know where he is, confound him, nor do I much care. We're about sick of him. Those were his words. Is that all? I asked. Well, it's all that you're to hear, my son, returned Silver. And now am I to choose? And now you are to choose, said Silver. Well, says I, I'm not such a fool as I know pretty well what I have to look for. Let the worst come to the worst. It's little I care. I've seen too many die since I fell in with you. But there's a thing or two I have to tell you, I said, and by this time I was quite excited. And the first is this. Here you are, in a bad way, ship lost, treasure lost, men lost, your whole business gone to wreck, and if you want to know who did it, it was I. I was in the apple barrel the night we sighted land, and I heard you, John, and you, Dick Johnson, and Hans, who is now at the bottom of the sea, and I told every word you said before the hour was out. And as for the schooner, it was I who cut her cable, and it was I that killed the men you had aboard her, and it was I who brought her here, where you'll see her no more, not one of you. The laugh's on my side. I've had the top of this business from the first. I no more fear you than I fear a fly. Kill me, if you please, or spare me, but one thing I'll say and no more. If you spare me, bygones are bygones, and when you fellows are in court for piracy, I'll save you all I can. It is for you to choose. Kill another and do yourselves no good, or spare me and keep a witness to save you from the gallows. I stopped, for I tell you I was out of breath, and to my wonder not a man of them moved, but they all sat staring at me like sheep. And while they were still staring, I broke out again. And now, Mr. Silver, I believe you're the best man here, and if things go the worst, I'll take it kind of you to let the doctor know the way I took it. I'll bear it in mind, said Silver, with an accent so curious that I could not, for the life of me, decide whether he were laughing at my request or had been favorably affected by my courage. I'll put one to that, cried the old mahogany-faced seaman. Morgan by name, whom I had seen in Long John's public house upon the quays of Bristol. It was him that knowed Black Dog. Well, and see here, added the sea cook, I'll put another again to that by thunder. For it was this same boy that faked the chart from Billy Bones. First and last, we've split upon Jim Hawkins. And here goes, said Morgan with an oath and he sprang up, drawing his knife as if he had been twenty. Avast there, cried Silver. Who are you, Tom Morgan? Maybe you thought you was captain here, perhaps. 
By the powers, I'll teach you better. Cross me, and you'll go where many a good man's gone before you, first and last these thirty years, some to the yard arm, shiver me timbers, and some to the board, and all to feed the fishes. There's never a man looked me between the eyes and seen a good day afterward, Tom Morgan. You may lay to that. Morgan paused, but a hoarse murmur rose from the others. Tom's right, said one. I stood hazed long enough from one, added another. I'll be hanged if I'll be hazed by you, John Silver. Did any of you gentlemen want to have it out with me? roared Silver, bending far forward from his position on the keg, with his pipe still glowing in his right hand. Put a name on what you're at. You ain't dumb, I reckon. Him that want shall get it. Have I lived this many years, and a son of a rum punch and cock his hat athwart my hoss at the latter end of it? You know the way. You're all gentlemen of fortune, by your account. Well, I'm ready. Take a cutlass, him that dares, and I'll see the color of his inside, crutch and all, before that pipe's empty. Not a man stirred, not a man answered. That's your sort, is it? he added, returning his pipe to his mouth. Well, you're quite a lot to look at. Not much worth the fight, you ain't. Perhaps you can understand King George's English. I'm captain here by election. I'm captain here because I'm the best man by a long sea mile. You won't fight, as gentlemen of fortune should. Then, by thunder, you'll obey, and you may lay to that. I like that boy now. I never seen a better boy than that. He's more a man than any pair of rats of you in this here house. And what I say is this. Let me see him who will lay a hand on him. That's what I say, and you may lay to it. There was a long pause after this. I stood straight up against the wall, my heart still going like a sledgehammer, but with a ray of hope now shining in my bosom. Silver leaned back against the wall, his arms crossed, his pipe in the corner of his mouth, as calm as though he had been in church. Yet his eyes kept wandering furtively, and he kept the tail of it on his unruly followers. They, on their part, drew gradually together towards the far end of the blockhouse, and the low hiss of their whispering sounded in my ears continuously, like a stream. One after another they would look up, and the red light of the torch would fall for a second on their nervous faces. But it was not towards me, it was towards Silver, that they turned their eyes. "'You seem to have a lot to say,' remarked Silver, spitting far into the air. "'Pipe up! Let me hear it, or lay to.' "'Axon, your pardon, sir,' returned one of the men. "'You're pretty free with some of the rules. Maybe you'll kindly keep an eye upon the rest.' This crew's dissatisfied. This crew don't valley bullying a marlin spike. This crew has its rights like any other crew's. I make so free as that, and by your own rules I take it we can talk together. I ask in your pardon, sir, and acknowledge in you for to be in captain at this present. But I claim my right, and steps outside for a council. And with an elaborate sea salute, this fellow, a long, ill-looking, yellow-eyed man of five and thirty, stepped coolly towards the door and disappeared out of the house. One after another, the rest followed his example, each making a salute as he passed, each adding some apology. According to the rules, said one. Forecastle consul, said Morgan. And with one remark or another, all marched out and left Silver and me alone with the torch. Now you look here, Jim Hawkins, he said in a steady whisper that was no more than audible. You're within half a plank of death, and what's a long sight worse of torture. They're going to throw me off, but you mark, I stand by you through thick and thin. I didn't mean to, no, not till you spoke up. I was about desperate to lose that much blunt and be hanged into the bargain. But I see you was the right sort. I says to myself, you stand by Hawkins, John, and Hawkins will stand by you. You're his last card, and by living thunder, John, he's yours. Back to back, says I. You save your witness, and he'll save your neck. 
I began dimly to understand. You mean all's lost? I asked. I by gum, I do, he answered. Ship gone, neck gone, that's the size of it. Once I looked into that bay, Jim Hawkins, and seen no schooner, well, I'm tough, but I gave out. As for that lot and their counsel, mark me, they're outright fools and cowards. I'll save your life, if so be I can, from them. But see here, Jim, tit for tat, you save Long John from swinging. I was bewildered. It seemed a thing so hopeless he was asking, he, the old buccaneer, the ringleader, throughout. What I can do, that I'll do, I said. It's a bargain, cried Long John. You speak up, plucky, and by thunder, I've a chance. He hobbled to the torch where it stood propped among the firewood and took a fresh light to his pipe. Understand me, Jim, he said, returning. I've a head on my shoulders, I have. I'm on Squire's side now. I know you've got that ship safe somewheres. How you done it, I don't know, but safe it is. I guess Hans and O'Brien turned soft. I never much believed in either of them. Now, mark me, I ask no questions, and I won't let others. I know when a game's up, I do, and I know a lad that's staunch. Ah, you that's young. You and me might have done a power of good together. He drew some cognac from the cask into a tin can again. Will you taste, messmate? he said, and when I refused. Well, I'll take a drain myself, Jim, said he. I need a caulker, for there's trouble on hand. And talking of trouble, why did that doctor give me the tart, Jim? My face expressed a wonder so unaffected that he saw the needlessness of further questions. Ah, well, he did, though, said he, and there's something under that, no doubt, something surely under that, Jim, bad or good. And he took another swallow of the brandy, shaking his great fair head like a man who expects the worst. <laughs>